thanks for the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak here and also for all the wonderful talks so far. And uh, thanks for all the people in the audience who like remain here at this very moment. Okay, so what, what I'm going to do is to talk about low rank approximations, theory and algorithms. In fact, I will not talk about algorithms today, uh, but we do, we do have a lot of algorithms. In fact, all the theory actually was easy to develop. The algorithms were the ones that took the most time. But anyway, so um, let's see how I can get to the point. Yeah. So uh, over the last few years, we have looked at uh, these randomized algorithms, and we have actually also looked at all the major matrix factorizations in numerical linear algebra. And it turns out that uh, um, all those major matrix factorizations can be turned into a form for rank uh, revealing of some kind. And uh, randomization plays a crucial role in that. If without randomization, these things will not work that well in practice. And also, maybe theoretically, they won't uh, be as strong. But with randomization, everything changes quite a bit. And in the past, I've been talking about single value related bonds on these uh, matrix factorizations. And uh, today, what's new will be on singular vectors. The singular vectors are not the kind of things people have talked about very much. Uh, part of the reason, as you will see, is that uh, they are much harder to deal with. Like, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's relatively easy to derive singular value bonds. That's what people typically do. But when you go to singular vectors, a new can of worms will be opened up, and uh, things will get very messy in some ways. So as I said, uh, we're not talking about the algorithms part of this. So the focus will just be uh, single vector bounds. And in particular, so when you talk about single va vector analysis, one of the key points is the form. What kind of bounds are you want to, do you want to get? And here we're going to talk about what's called a sine theta theorem for randomized subset iteration and also block Lanchard's algorithm. So the block Lanchard's really is not the right way to call this. It's, just, it's rather maybe block diagonalization, diagonalization for finding singular values. OK, so the goal, of course, in these low rank matrix approximations is to get squeeze the most juice out of this. Like you do the most accurate calculation possible, and you do the best analysis, and you do the, um, I mean, think about maybe extensions. Also, algorithm-wise, you make the uh, algorithm as efficient as possible. So what we're going to do, as I mentioned, is we're going to actually first look at the single value bounds. I've talked about those bounds like in the past. Some of, some of the people in the audience may have heard about this before. Uh, but this is actually a way to uh, go through uh, how randomization helps with these matrix factorizations. And also, it's a way to establish the kind of bonds we want to eventually establish for singular vectors. Um, so this talk is going to be extremely theoretical. There's, uh, you, you're going to see bonds after bonds and things. So uh, if, you want, uh, if you have questions, just interrupt at any time. Um, so I'm going to start with QR factorizations. So uh, classical, classical QR was developed for least squares problems. And then they found out that by doing QR after column permutations, some rank revealing probability shows up. And uh, later on, we found out that if you do the column permutation correctly, then you can actually work out some single value bonds that are very nice. So in this particular case, what happens in this notation is that you have this pi, which is actually a column permutation. Your matrix is a, is a matrix. You shuffle the columns of the matrix M. And after that, you do this QR factorization. It turns out that uh, if you want to do a low rank approximation in this form, all you have to do is to throw in the C part of the matrix. The, uh, bottom corner C matrix, and it's meant to be kind of small. And if you do that, you get a rather decent 
approximation already. So here, uh, this, this is a tall, uh, tall um, number, tall sub j, which is the ratio of these single values. And the indexing is quite strange. So the way this goes is that, is that you're looking for a rank k approximation. But you run the QR L times. The L is meant to be something bigger than k. So depending on how far you go, so this ratio tau sub j depends on the L and the j. And you can see that uh, so the way this is arranged, the smaller the index, the bigger the single value. So that if your L is rather bigger than j, you could expect the ratio to be very small, especially if your single value is decay. And if that is the case, Upstairs and a J downstairs. Yes, L plus one. So you're splitting this into the three pieces, top, bottom, and sort of middle. Something in the middle, yeah. you, you, so kind you of, want to get a gap yeah, between you, yeah, L, and, L yeah. plus one and J. Yeah, yeah exactly. We act, later on, when we talk about the uh, single vector bonds, you're going to see another gap. You're right, this is one of the gaps. Yeah, it's actually kind of interesting that uh, you pointed out. So there's no gap. This is a way to sort of engineer a gap in. By exactly. Way. This is a, yes, yes. So, um, if you allow this tau j to be small for big enough L, what happens is that uh, your upper bound and the lower bound will become close. That means that you will get a very good approximation to the single values right there. And uh, this is especially true for data matrices, because the data for data matrices, the single values will decay, but they decay rather slowly, which requires some reasonable gap some reasonable larger value for L than J. And if that is the case, you really get a rather good approximation. So that, uh, this is a good example. So what we're looking at, at is a metal gear. So this is actually just uh, maybe about 200 by 200, 2,000 by 2,000 matrix, sorry. And if you do QR on this matrix, this is what you get. So this thing does not anyway, look like this original matrix. And uh, if you do QR with the classical column pivoting on this matrix, you take like 200 steps. You see that this looks very close to the original matrix. And uh, this classical QR with the column pivoting is known to be rather slow. If you add an R to it, if you do a randomized version of QR with the column pivoting, then you can make this algorithm go as fast as this. In fact, faster. Um, there's an information where you can actually make this guy faster than this guy by a factor of two. Um, but that is a different issue. So what you can see is that uh, this picture has exactly the same quality as this. But it actually, uh, it, uh, you know, Computation is very fast because of the randomization process. What's the time difference between the top right and the bottom left? This one and this one? No, well, those are, those are the same you said, these two. Uh, this one is faster but, uh, than this one. This one with, the, with this yeah, one? Yeah. This is going to be, uh, I think this one is <coughs> probably a factor of three slower than this one. That's for the. Um, classical QR factorization. And uh, what happened was that, uh, what we saw was that uh, if your single values decay quickly, then you could expect a very good approximation to the SVD with, a, with a, what we call spectrum revealing QR factorization. But it's still not exactly the same kind of SVD. And if you do one more step of QR, that is, you do a QR with column pivoting on the matrix, and you flip the matrix to another QR. That is what we call flip-flop QR. And what happens is that if you do that, your accuracy improves by a square. So instead of tall squared earlier, now there's a tall to the fourth. Just one more step. And you can engineer this thing so that the whole process is done at the same cost of QR. <coughs> So here's an example. What you see here is a tower. Again, if you do QR without column pivoting, you get nothing out of this. And if you do QR with 
column pivoting, you get this picture. If you do, I've got to be careful. Um, this is the truncated SVD. This is the best you can hope for. And this one is when you do, it's one of these two, I'm actually a little bit confused. Yeah. Um, they're both, in fact. It's just uh, the difference is, is implementation. But these two pictures, am I saying this right? Yeah, they should look almost the same as far as quality goes. But there's an improvement from QR with the column pivoting to QR flip flop. And uh, that's QR. And uh, another classical factorization is Cholesky. And again, if you actually reshuffle the columns and the rows of the matrix correctly, then you can expect to get a good approximation to the SVD in the sense that uh, if you drop the CL, the training matrix, then what you get is this part of the L matrix. That's almost like the squiddle of your original matrix in that uh, if you look at this part of the matrix, the SVD, the single values, would be like the square root of the original single value up to a constant factor that's close to one, especially when your single values decay. Of course, when you don't have single value decay, this tall J thing could be all to one. In that case, you at least get a fraction, kind of fraction of the true single values. And uh, another thing would be LE factorization, right? These are the classical matrix factorization in numerical uh, linear algebra. And for LU, it's the same thing, in that uh, this time, if you flip the rows and the columns in the right way, you will get a similar bound as before. And uh, what I said here was that uh, we flip the rows and the columns of the matrix. That typically is LU with complete pivoting which is a big no-no in numerical analysis, because we know this is extremely slow. But on the other hand, if you allow randomization, then this piece can be done at the cost of LU with column pivoting only. So it's actually very, with, not with column pivoting, rather with uh, partial pivoting. So it's actually extremely fast to do this. And uh, one of Michael's favorite factors is the CUR. The CUR is nothing but LU with something in the middle. This will be the L, this will be the U, and something in the middle. This is a small matrix. And the difference between an LU and a CUR, really, is just this thing, the thing in the middle. What it contributes, as far as accuracy goes, is the fact that uh, instead of a tau for LU, now it's tau J squared. So you actually get the accuracy of QR for approximation. And the advantage of doing this factorization is that uh, you have the L matrix and the U matrix from the original matrix. And that will help if your matrix that you started with is sparse. If you wanted to do a sparse kind of rank uh, reviewing or what we call spectrum reviewing factorization, then this probably is the best approach. You, you remain sparse, but you get a very good uh, uh, rank, low rank approximation to the matrix. Any questions so far? OK, so to compute a low rank approximation, you do not have to stick with matrix factorization. If you want to have a little higher accuracy, what you could do is uh, randomized subset iteration. It's like an uh, enhanced version of randomized, randomized power method. And uh, this is a, a pseudo code for it. You do essentially A times A transpose. You raise this thing to Q of power, and you multiply that to A times omega. The randomization comes in the form of random omega matrix. That's the initial matrix, essentially. If you make this thing random, then everything else is the classical subset iteration. So what do we gain by this? So essentially, the whole thing is subset iteration, except that your initial matrix is random. 
And it turns out that uh, if you do this, you get a rather attractive singular value convergence bound. Um, so it goes like this. So these are all relative bounds. The convergent eigen singular values are sandwiched in between the sigma j and sigma j divided by this thing in the denominator. In the denominator, you have a c constant that depends on the dimension. But what's important really is this ratio. So this is the ratio between um, sigma l minus p plus 1 and sigma j. So what you do is, in practice, you would pick the l to be bigger than j. And also, there's a p factor. What is the p factor for? The p is defined to be this log, log of 2 over delta. What is delta? Delta is the kind of reliability factor. So it's a user provided, provided a number that uh, um, controls the failure probability. So you could like the data to be as small as you want. If your data is small, that means your probability of success is high. Because the failure probability of this algorithm expansionally depends on data. So C squared is n. So you're setting a big gap to get a, a reasonably good estimate there, though, right? You're right. It's actually C, you're right. C squared is not just n, right? Like there's an L factor there, too. Yeah, so it's actually. Um, um, there is actually potentially a big factor here, you're right. And you can actually construct a measure to where the factor of n cannot be ignored. You, probably the L factor is due to some analysis thing, but the n factor is indeed there. OK, so that's the thing. So um, what we want to do next is to uh, discuss this in a little bit detail. So if you indeed do like subsequent iteration, so we have this extra factor, extra prime to L involved. So what does it do? And what does it, how does it affect the method? So if you pick the L to be big enough, then you would expect this ratio to be small, which means that your method will converge more quickly. On the other hand, if you pick your L to be too big, then it costs too much at each iteration. So there's a balancing act. How do you optimally choose L? It's actually an album question. You know, because you don't beforehand you do not know how the single value distributes. So you have no way to actually figure out this ratio to begin with. So it's hard to say. But uh, typically you make it, this L somewhat larger than P, um, larger than J. That should be good enough. OK, so that's the uh, substitution. And what we're going to do next is to look at the Lanchos, block Lanchos for biodiagonalization. And this is the math for block diagonalization. So I'm not going to get into the, too much of the detail. Um, the talk is not about all these formulas uh, themselves. Rather, it's about how these methods will converge. So you can ignore all these things. It's just that this is the formality for computing these biodiagonalizations. And this is a pseudocode. It's easier to understand this way. It's more compact. Uh, at least mathematically, this is how it goes. So the difference between Lanchos, block, diagonal, uh, block diagonalization, and uh, substance iteration is that uh, uh, instead of this matrix for Substitute iteration. What you do is you put all of these matrices together. For all of these powers you have computed before, that gives you a bigger matrix. Presumably, this is a bigger matrix, so it gives you more information. And indeed, it does. So again, the omega here is a random matrix. But now, of course, the dimension, the number of columns in omega changes. You form this matrix, and you look at an orthogonal basis for this matrix. That's where you get the single vector information. And as we do this projection with this Q basis, so that brings your AA matrix to a much smaller matrix. On this, you do some truncated SVD. And that will give you good uh, approximation to your original matrix. OK, so let's see. So here's the 
kind of ugly looking bond, but this ugliness will serve a purpose. So it turns out that uh, uh, the form is slightly different for biogranization than for all these other methods we talked about before. In that uh, now, in the error analysis, convergence analysis, there's an extra thing involved, which is the T, the chapter polynomial. And also, we artificially introduce a number R. The R in the equation, and also the P, that depends on R. Those are analysis dependent parameters. They are not part of the algorithm, they are part of the analysis. We'll talk about how you actually choose those for analysis purpose. Okay. So it turns out that you can actually derive a bond like this. Here you see another C. And this is a C that um, depends on the distribution of single values. And it also depends on how you pick your omega matrix. And this is a C where we actually do not know how the distribution works. Even when you're sticking maybe normal distribution, how this C comes out, it's actually extremely hard to do. We actually have no clue how to do a statistical analysis. All we could argue is that uh, it should be reasonable, it should be a reasonable bounded constant for normal distribution. So we're going to say this is constant. So the check trip polynomial gets involved because it's got this very nice convergence property that uh, as soon as you, your argument is outside of the range from negative to negative one to one, then your polynomial shoots up to infinity very quickly. How am I doing with time? Yeah. Okay, that's good. So let me just get to here. And it turns out that the strange form in that analysis allows you to choose those parameters to conclude this. This is exactly what we want. That uh, if you do Lanchos, you actually don't get like a linear convergence. You get super linear convergence. And as this example uh, illustrates. So what you see here, these are block diagonalization with different block sizes from 2 to like, uh, um, I think, 100. And uh, those three lines up there, they're uh, randomized subset iteration. What you can see is that uh, this is log scale. So what you see up there is linear. That indicates linear convergence. Here, this is actually curvy. It's actually super linear convergence. So you can prove that even in finite dimensions just by, instead of choosing those Chebyshev polynomials, picking polynomials that knock out some of the other singular values that you want to select. So you can't really say that this is super linearly convergent because your matrix size is fixed, so has a fixed dimension. So Hank Vanderforst and, and Jared and, and, and uh, Trent Bender Slaus uh, study this for conjugate gradients. And they mm. do it in finite dimensions, not by saying that there's true superlinear convergence, mm. but by saying that there's an increasing linear rate that forms an envelope, say, that gives you this kind of description. Yeah, probably that would be one way to So you just get your constants it. change, and then thus the constants for the faster rates get larger. So that's why they don't pertain to the Earth. In range. fact, that actually can be derived from uh, the strange bound that I mentioned. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, probably you can actually output this somewhere. The You get this bound. Oops, what did I do? You get this as long as your data matrix actually has decaying single values. That's all that is required. OK, so I'm going to hurry up and. Uh, what is it? So, Jean, we use the Chebyshev's thing. And he did a Gaussian projection, which was slower than the other ones, but you got stronger concentration on the Chebyshev polynomials. And then mm -hmm. used the Chebyshev semi iterative method because it was one synchronization point. Uh, I think you know that. Uh, so, I, how, where does Chebyshev. Is Chebyshev under the hood in. in um, the subspace iteration, or where? where it's not how, actually. How are you using that? I don't understand. Uh, no, you don't. You don't get to chip chip with subspace iteration. You only get to it with this bidiagonalization technique. Okay, so this under the hood, there's some you need a chip chip on the yeah. bidiagonalization. So you you need this like part of subspace for this purpose. But if you um, 
your analysis is using Chebyshev polynomials to, to bound what Krilov is doing. Alternatively, yeah. you could replace Krilov by actually using Chebyshev polynomials, and that's what I think Michael's talking about. Yeah, I guess about. he did this, and so this is in the that case, case, yeah. Okay. The super linear conversion yeah. should be locked into the linear. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Okay. It still works. So yeah, so, oops. Oh, this is actually the only direction. So, it could, this thing uh, is derived from this strange uh, bond where you have an artificial parameter, artificial parameter R, artificial parameter P. Right? If you choose these to both go to infinity as the power Q increases, that is where you get superlinear convergence. We can see this again uh, at the end. Anyway, so um, that's for the singular vectors. And what we're going to do next is to look at a singular, um, that was singular values. This is now going to be singular vectors. And as, as I said earlier, the singular vectors are more tricky. But when you do data analysis, right, people, for example, talk about PCA. What are PCAs? Like a principal component analysis. Components are directions, right, with a length. So you have these principal components. Their directions are exactly singular vectors. So singular vectors are important in this uh, sense. And people typically don't analyze these guys because they are nasty. Uh, why are they nasty? So we look at a simple three by three matrix example. So you have a, uh, a matrix that looks like this. And uh, on the diagonal, we have 1, 1, and a 10 to the negative 6. You would rather drop the 10 to the negative 6 to get a rank 2 approximation, for example. But for this A matrix, you can work out the SVD exactly. Here, I only give you the first order terms. So the, uh, these are the single values. So these two guys are close to each other. The datas are like a perturbations, let's say. And uh, the, we're going to concentrate on the right singular vectors, the V matrix. The V matrix looks like this. So the last singular vector, that's 1, 0, 0. But the earlier two, they have this representation using this theta angle. And the theta angle is defined with this formula. So it's so messy. But the point is that uh, this formula is a ratio of these two tiny perturbations. So if you, you know, change your data in any simple way, and then this data changes quite a bit. So what happens is that uh, a small perturbation will change this quite a bit, meaning that uh, you really uh, you really can't bound this well unless your tiny your changes are really really tiny in some particular way. On the other hand, if you're looking for a rank two approximation, what you care about is not that uh, these vectors, how they change individually. Rather, you care about the span of these two vectors, v1 and v2. And if you're looking at the span of v1 and v2, you see that it's this part. They don't change. The change is zero. So this makes a huge difference. So when you do singular vector analysis, the message is that uh, you don't look at individual vectors. You look at the subspace. And this was first discussed by Davis and Kahan in 1970, 50 years ago. So this is actually for the symmetric eigenvalue version. And uh, what they're saying is that uh, if I have a matrix P hat that has noise G, and uh, I want to get a rank k approximation, what I can do is to look at subspaces between what I want and what I do not want. And uh, here I define this thing called absolute gap. That's another gap we're going to see. That's the difference between these single eigenvalues. And uh, then the angle between these subspaces this is a way to measure how the subsurfaces change. If this thing is 0, that means you're getting the exact thing. If it's not that big, that means you get a good approximation. And uh, the sign between these two subsurfaces is bounded by the change in the data divided by this gap, difference between the eigenvalues. And the k is the rank that you're after. So the focus is going to be on the subspace, not on the individual vectors. 
So that's one form that we need to keep in mind. We don't do vectors, we do subspaces. But then there's another form that was done by Rankin and Lee, which, who was Kahan's student, like uh, um, almost 30 years after his original work. So the lesson now is that, uh, especially for data matrices, we know that a single matrix decay. So what, did, what that means is that the gaps can be really, really small because the single matrix don't differ very much. And now if you are looking at what's called a relative gap, this is the gap that we, we used to talk about. But if you take the gap and divide by this thing itself, this itself can be very small. When you take the ratio, this thing becomes bigger. Okay, and this should be the thing that you need to bound the gaps, bound the perturbation in the subspaces. This is under the particular form of change, like D times P times D. If your perturbations are in what they call multiplicative perturbation. It's not to say that we're gonna do that kind of perturbation, rather uh, this is the form we will take in that uh, you have error on, one, on the numerator, but the denominator gap needs to be a relative gap. So these are the two points we need to take into account before they divide a gap, a bound, that is, for the subspaces. And uh, if we go back to the randomized surface iteration, this is the code that we actually saw earlier. So now what we want to do is to put a singular vector bound on it, and in the form of relative sine theta theorem. So what we're going to do is to bound the angle between these spaces. So you want the V1, but the uh, iterations will give you the V1 hat. The convergence is going to be governed by this ratio to the power. That is what we saw before in a somewhat different form. But what's extra is this gap in the denominators I call relative gap. So now this market making one gap here, so there are two gaps in this. One is this relative gap, the other is this ratio. So how do you kind of keep track of these two things? So when you do the iteration, you want your iteration to converge quickly. And so this ratio governs convergence. You choose your parameters, you choose your iterations, so that uh, when this thing is small, then your method converges quickly. But no matter how your method converges, there's this other gap that's in your way. That governs the subspace accuracy. That is, even if you have driven this thing to small, you still have to multiply your error, whatever it is, by this factor. One minute. Yeah, I have one more slide. Um, so here this is a verification of our validation of our results. This is for like uh, NIPS papers and uh, they have an expert, uh, like decaying spectrum. But let me actually get to the Lanchos thing so you can see the um, final result. You can do the same thing with uh, Lanchos block diagonalization and you also get a bound like this. Again, you have this extra relative gap in the denominator, and this is the thing that governs convergence. So if you pick the P and R correctly, this polynomial gov gives you superlinear convergence. So again, what happens is that uh, you have superlinear convergence up to a gap for the subspaces. Thank you very much. <laughs>